Hi. So as he said, I'm Jared Forsyth. I'm going to be talking about managing app state in React. And this is what I look like on the internet. A um, little bit different, so you can recognize me. And uh, right now I work at Khan Academy doing mobile development and web development. And we're trying to make it so that anyone, anywhere can have access to a world-class education for free. A couple of important points about Khan Academy. First, it was founded in 2006, which for reference is when jQuery was first released. So that's eons ago in JavaScript time. <laughs> and also, we have a lot of really rich JavaScript heavy applications. And we're also a, a very early adopter of React. So managing app state in React is something that we uh, care a lot about. So today, first, I'll start with talking about the problem, why I think this is worth giving a talk about. And then I'll talk about some of the current solutions. And I'll conclude with some recommendations for you to think about when you're addressing this problem in your own apps. So first, why is this a problem? Why is there even the question of how to manage app state in React? Well, when React came out, it was the V in MVC, right? It's just a library. It's not a flame framework. And we're familiar with MVC. You've got data. You've got a way to present the data and then a way to manage the data. And we, we can't just not model or control. So some of us had large backbone apps, and we tried to fit React in there in between the backbone models and backbone controllers. Other people had AIM. Angular or Ember apps and tried to do similar things. But it actually turns out that React is fairly opinionated about data. And that was one of the things that first attracted me to it, because React talks about state and props. And there's some data that you're allowed to modify and other data that you're not. And so fitting React in with a two-way data binding model or um, subscription model just kind of goes against the grain. And so pretty much since React came out, we've had this question of how to manage app state in React, especially shared state that's shared between different components throughout your tree. So React came out in 2013, three years ago. And a year later, the React team talked about Flux, which was the solution. Uh, it was the way to do app state. It wasn't a library. It was a paradigm. And Pretty much ever since then, there's been a rush of libraries and methods explaining how to manage app state. So I'm going to talk mainly about Relay and Redux with a couple of ClojureScript libraries thrown in for inspiration. The background for how I'm going to compare these libraries, we'll say we've got a little users table where each user has a color. And then we have a pure component that just expects to receive a color on the props and a way to change that color. So this pure component doesn't have any state itself. It doesn't know how to get that state. And the methods that I'll be describing are responsible for figuring out what state to give this component and giving it a callback function so that it can update that state. But first, I'll talk about how to do that in just React. Um, because e even though... <laughs> Even though React claims to just be the V, as I said, it has opinions about state. It knows about state. And you can, you can model and control your data relatively well for small applications. And to set that up, you just have a root component that owns the state, and it has some methods to update that state. And then to get that data to our pure component, it passes the state down each intermediate layer to our pure component along with the update method so that it can uh, update the state it receives. And this is what it might look like. You have a get initial state where our data just lives there, and then a, an update method that will take a user ID and a color and update the state for that user ID. And then in the render method, we don't have any intermediate layers, so we can just give the color for user one and a callback function that will just take a color and update it. And this works out great for small-scale apps, um, but it can get really cumbersome when you have larger apps, when you have lots of shared state. You find yourself plumbing 
the props down through all these levels, and it's, it's easy to miss one, and it's hard to move things around. If you need to refactor, you need to replumb everything. And so that's, that's why we look for another way to do this more formally. Redux is probably the most popular way to do this right now. Um, it came out as the answer to the Flux question. Like, there were lots of Flux libraries, and now, like, only, everyone only talks about Redux. Um, and it's for a lot of good reasons. Redux has made some very uh, specific design choices in addition to Flux that make it advantageous. But to, to set up, we have action creators and reducers that work together to change our state. And if you remember um, Lynn Clark's talk from yesterday, it, you'll have an idea of how this works. I won't go into it. But the action creator describes what we're going to do. We're going to update the color. And then the reducer takes that description and returns a new state so that we can effectively mutate. And in order for our pure component to get access to this state and the updater, there is a wrapper function that happens at the point where we need the data. So we just make a wrapper around our pure component that specifies a way to get our, the data we need from the global state, and it also passes in a callback function to update that state. Here's what the action creator and reducer might look like. Uh, we just have a description of a mutation and a way to handle the mutation. This second function looks a lot like the update method that we had in our plain old React component. There's not much difference here. And then to use that, here's an example of using the connect wrapper function where we describe what prop we need. We need the color, and we can extract that from the global state. And we also pass in a function that will call our action creator. So the benefits of this, it's declarative. Each component is able to declare what state it needs and how to get that from the global state. You don't have to pass down all of this state through all of the props. And you can move a component from one place to another without worrying about having to replumb everything. It's also nice because the mutation logic, the way you update your state, is totally separated from the view. It's defined somewhere else. Uh, it's pure functions. And you can separately test them. And usually, it's the updating of state that contains lots of um, really difficult logic that you want to make sure is fully tested, whereas the view logic is usually pretty simple. And of course, what you pay for this, for these benefits, is a little bit of setup, a little boilerplate. And for example, if you want to create a new action in the typical way of organizing a Redux application, you touch three different files. And if you're in a larger application where these benefits really pay off, you don't mind paying the cost. But for a very small one, it can feel a little bit cumbersome. At Khan Academy, we started using Redux in production uh, several months ago when we were starting a new product that was for supporting local math learning competitions. And we had been using Flux before. We started using Flux a year ago on a different product and liked it. But this time, Redux had gained general popularity, and we really liked the immutability of it and the easy testability of the reducers. And uh, we found it's really paid off. There are still some state mutations that, are, that we found it's difficult to represent in the Redux model. Uh, Redux doesn't eliminate all complexity for you. There are still uh, complex things, but it makes it easier to test and easier to think about. One of the things that we love about Redux is that the model is so simple. It's even simpler than Flux. And so it's easier to get everything into your head to realize how state will be changing in your app. Now, Reframe is a ClojureScript library that's very similar to Redux. And they're both actually based on functional reactive programming ideas. And they're both uh, inspired by the Elm language. And so the action creators and reducers in Reframe are pretty much the same. But the big thing that it adds is subscriptions. Thanks for the hint. Um, so subscriptions, it, in addition to defining the way that state is updated, subscriptions define how state is obtained. 
in Redux, you define at the place where you wrap the component how to get the individual bits of state. But subscriptions give a name to each piece of state that you want, and then that can be reused between components. And then at the wrapper component, you just define which subscriptions you want to use. Uh, here's a little visual demonstration of how that works. In Redux, for the header, to-do list, and filter picker components, you might have a separate state to props function that uh, at point of use defines how to get the state you need from the global state. Whereas in Reframe, you have these subscriptions, and uh, then each component just uses one of those subscriptions. The benefits of this are that the, there's more logic that's abstracted away from the view layer. And these subscriptions can be reused between different components that need similar kinds of data. As well as uh, subscriptions memoize their work. So if some part of the data changes, uh, the subscriptions won't uh, redo unnecessary work if their dependent data hasn't changed. And the cost of this, of course, is a little bit more complexity. The memoization can be tricky if you update your data in a, in a way that it's not expecting. Um, but in many cases, this, uh, these benefits are more than enough to compensate. Relay, as you know, was released uh, or announced last year at this conference and then released several months ago. And it's the way that Facebook handles this problem. For the setup, you need a GraphQL server and I won't talk about how to do that. That's a whole different beast. Um, and it, if you already have a large server and, and database system, it, it can be a lot of effort to make it work with the GraphQL standard. But once you do, all of the queries are taken care of for you. For mutations, you still need to do some extra work. And they're defined both on the client side and the server side. And these enable some extra optimizations that Relay is able to give you. Using the state and updating the state is similar to Redux, although getting access is done even more declaratively by making GraphQL queries, which then uh, Relay can use to get whatever state you need from the server, cache it intelligently, and then serve it up to you. And mutations are done in the same way as Redux, essentially. For setup, as I said, once you have the GraphQL server taken care of, queries are fine. But mutations are defined both on the client and the server. And this, you might be thinking, is this just to update a single attribute of the user? This is to change the user's color? I thought Redux had boilerplate. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll remind you that the, the extra work that you do for mutations allows many different performance optimizations and uh, that can more than outweigh the cost, for, especially for large-scale apps. The way to use this, the, um, the update function is very similar to Redux. You just create a mutation. And then the query defines what state the component is likely to need. In this case, just the color. Although you'll notice, we also reference the mutation that we might want to make, because the mutation it's possible that it will also need data that our component doesn't need. For example, in order to mutate the, the color of a user, the mutation needs to know the user ID. And so that is specified in the fragment on the mutation. With Relay being a much larger solution, a much more comprehensive solution, there are many more benefits, but also you uh, pay the setup cost. The benefits being that it's more declarative than Redux. There's no custom getter logic required. You can change queries all you want, you don't, and uh, the GraphQL server takes care of all that for you. And the tight server in integration between Relay and GraphQL enables intelligent caching, optimistic updates, and minimal fetching. And one of the best things from my perspective is that it will give you error messages at compile time if you have a query that is incompatible with your database. If you misspell an attribute name, in the query, or you misconfigure one of your queries, uh, it will let you know that you will have an error at production, which can give you a lot more confidence about the integrity of your system. 
the cost of this, again, you need to set up a GraphQL backend. Currently, it doesn't have a solution for state that only exists on the client and doesn't need to be persisted to the server. And there's also a lot more complexity involved because of all of the incredible optimizations that it gives you. And in order to enable those optimizations, there's a little bit less flexibility. Uh, there are some mutations that Relay can't do at the moment, and there are some ways of organizing your data that are hard to fit into the GraphQL paradigm. At Khan Academy, we experimented with Relay shortly after it uh, was released, and one of our engineers redid one of our pages and created a GraphQL endpoint for a small section of the data. And it was really fun to play with GraphQL and see just the power and the expressivity of this query language. But in the end, we decided that the, the costs were prohibitive, at least for our case at that point. For one thing, setting up GraphQL for a small part of our database was okay, but to expand it to the rest, there were some ways that we model data that wouldn't have worked as well with the graph structure. And the endpoint that we set up was only read only. And as I said, mutations take a lot more investment. Ohm Next, you may have heard of. It is like Relay. It was inspired by Relay and Falcor and other things. Uh, and it's also in ClojureScript, which for some of you might be an advantage. For others, might make you want to stay away from it. I recently got into ClojureScript, and I love it. But it removes the dependency for a GraphQL server. And it, it is fairly agnostic about what server you use, so it's more flexible that way. It also has first-class support for client-only state, and it has custom query resolution. I'll talk a little bit about that now. In Relay, when your components have queries, Relay just sends that to the GraphQL endpoint intelligently with custom caching and all this. But in Ohm Next, if you know a little bit about your state, and you know that one part of your state is, I need to refresh it all the time, I'll just send that directly to my dynamic endpoint. But another part of the state is never going to change. It's static. You can send that request to a CDN with HTTP caching headers, and the browser just knows how to do caching for you. And then if there's other state that only lives on the client, such as error messages or other things, it can take care of that for you. The benefits of the custom query re resolution are that both client and remote state are fully supported. And it's also server agnostic. You don't have to rewrite or write a large wrapper on top of your current server in order to take advantage of these benefits. And it's very flexible. But the flexibility and less integration with the server means that it's much less optimized than Relay. There are some things that it can't give you, although it does still have optimistic updates, minimal fetching, and other things. And it's also still under active development, and there are many loose ends. In conclusion, some recommendations. First, have conventions about how you manage your app state. Regardless of what you choose to do, decide what you're going to do and stick with it. Because if you don't, you're going to run into the problem where just doing it with React is a little too cumbersome, so you have ad hoc solutions scattered throughout your app, and they're all different, and it gets much harder to reason about where your state is, where it lives, who updates it, et cetera. And one of the, con one of the conventions I suggest you have is to use pure components as much as possible. So components that only receive props, they don't have any state themselves, they don't know how to get state, they rely on their parents to give them the state, and also methods to update the state if they need it. And the benefit of this is that it makes it much more easy to swap out, to use a different app state method, uh, management method, if you need it. If all of your views are pure components, then you can switch out the wrappers from normal React to Redux or to Relay and save yourself a lot of the migration time. And then as you're looking at these different things, just examine the trade-offs. They all have costs and benefits. I like to imagine them on two axes. 
On, on the bottom, we have the app size or complexity. This is wherever your app is. And then on the top, there's how much effort it will take. Effort can look like how much does it take to set up? What are all the moving parts? How much will it cost to maintain over time? And how understandable is the system? And app size isn't just lines of code. It can be team size. It can be your support expectations. And also, what performance guarantees uh, is your app required to fulfill? If we put React on here without any other libraries, it works fine for very small apps. But as you get larger, there comes a point when you can't take it anymore. And you, you need to switch to something else. So Redux might be that thing. It takes a little bit more setup. There's a little bit more boilerplate. But that really pays off as you get to larger, more complex app with more shared state. And then Relay has even more setup. But as you get to very large apps and things that you will be supporting for the long term, it can really pay off. When you're thinking about this question for yourselves, one of the things you need to ask is, where along this line is my app? And what should I choose? Thank you.